Welcome to Everyone is Talking About to God. We're in part two on a series of a theology of camp, and we're talking about French kings, English dandies, and drag queens. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast. It's Damon, your host, and we're in the middle of a series on this podcast called A Theology of Camp. And I'm back sooner than you thought, wasn't I? The very next day, we're trying to put this out because I want to put out these parts throughout this whole week because one, I don't want to drag this on, and two, I have a lot to say on this stuff and I need to get it out there. So go listen to part one of this series where we introduced the term camp and talked about how it related with the Met Gala, because that's why we're talking about this last Monday. The theme was camp, notes on fashion, based on Susan Sontag's essay, Notes on Camp. And this episode, we're just going to keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper each part of the series. And in this one, we're going to talk about the history we're going to get pretty detailed, but of course we can't go through every single detail because one, it's a lot. We're going over hundreds of years in different countries. And two, well, like I said in the last one, it's really hard to define a sensibility, really hard to define an aesthetic. And so I'm just giving you scenes and images throughout history to help us kind of trace some sort of stream throughout history to find ourselves here at camp. Now, we're going to start talking about Louis the Fourteenth, the French king, and then we're going to end up talking about dandies, and then we're going to end up talking about drag and the LGBT community and how they claimed their own camp aesthetic and really defined it for a Western American context. Now, let's travel back in time here to the middle of the 1600s in France and introduce ourselves to Louis XIV, who was a king since he was four years old. And the last time we talked about the term camp first being mentioned, one of the first early, early mentions was in a play where a character said, camp about on one leg, put your hand on your hip and strut about like a comedy king. And... We talked about how it begins as a pose, as a kind of posture and attitude. And Louis the Fourteenth, if you just Google image him, he's pretty much in that pose in every picture. Louis the Fourteenth is also the reason ballet exists. Now, ballet, when it first began, was just a small part of opera. And kind of similar how several plays include a dance number. We all seen those. That's that's the only place you would see ballet initially. And Louis the Fourteenth, who later called himself the Sun King in reference to Apollo, played Apollo as a teenager when he was in these plays and when he did ballet. And he loved dancing. He loved playing these very extravagant, flamboyant characters and dancing about and really making a craft of it. And then when he was older, he had this palace built, huge, huge thing called Versailles. I'm sure plenty of you have heard that. And he would have all these people come. The reason it was so famous is because he would have all these people come constantly for parties and ceremonies, for mass, re religious rituals. And he would make this huge extravagant event out of everything and have everyone come with extremely strict, complicated dress rules, have, having to dress very extravagantly and learn plenty of dances as it, it's like everyone knew these little social dances that they would all participate in. He required you to learn way more with more complex moves and as he became more and more obsessed with this going on in his palace and with ballet and building and composing ballet that required all these complicated steps, 
ballet became its own thing. And he was so passionate about it. And he was so passionate about just being so theatrical. Not only did he love these events, but he would also require several people to watch him waking up every morning and getting dressed. And then at the end of the day, taking all his clothes off and getting in bed. But there was a very significant reason for all these theatrics. It wasn't just because of his love for the theater. Like I said, he was a king since he was four years old, but he didn't have the power of a king when he was four years old. Because he was so young, the power was given to the ministers and advisors around him. And they just made his life irritating and miserable. And he felt like he knew that they were trying to take the power away from him and keep the power. And so by the time he became an adult and actually had the power, he didn't want to see that happen again and see anyone try to take his power away from him or to have anyone overthrow the government because of his less than perfect way of ruling this time. So to ensure that there was never an uprising never a conspiracy behind closed doors against him. He made sure to always keep the patricians at Versailles around and in his sights and always busy and always overwhelmed with these events and these dances and these parties and having to participate in these complicated ways of dressing extravagantly and looking and appearing extravagantly and when they're not doing that watching him be extravagant and theatrical noble men and women were told where they could sit and stand and when they could enter or exit a room and what rooms they could enter and exit he was very very particular about this theater of his life one writer worded it this way, saying it was all designed to keep their aristocracy perpetually nervous and literally on their toes. And so for him, ballet and the theatrics and extravagant dress and these parties and these ceremonies were all a power move. It was all political distraction. So... Camp, this look starts here. But when we talk about camp, and we're going to get very deep into this, when we talk about camp, we talk about it belonging to the marginalized and being used as a tool to bring attention to the unseen in society. It didn't start out as that. We're just talking about the look at first, not necessarily the social element yet. This is where the look began, though as just one big distraction. The writer Mark Booth wrote a book on camp, and he talked about this time, and he also says all camp people are to be found in the margins of society, and the richest vein of camp is generally to be found in the margins of the margins. Marginal to the king's own set at Versailles was that of his brother, who was also called the king of mischief makers. His brother was named Felipe, or also called Mansour. And I'm going to read more now out of Mark Booth's book in the part where he's talking about Mansour. And he says, Modeling his personal style on that of the effeminate Henry III, Mansour surrounded himself with exquisites. He had been educated to be totally ignorant of all political and practical matters so as not to be a threat to the king, possibly spending part of his childhood in girls' clothes. He grew up to wear rings, bracelets, ribbons, women's jewelry, and perfume. He was notorious for his underworld connections, for his irreverence, for his sodomy, and for many things much too disgusting to include here. Mark Booth's words there, not mine. There's also this man at the time in France named de Choisy. Forgive me for my terrible French pronunciation throughout this whole thing. Anyway, de Choisy, who wrote a memoir later in life, actually it was found by one of his family members and released after he died, called Transvestite Memoirs of the Abbe de Choisy. And these memoirs talked about when he was young and he would cross-dress and dress as a woman and try to appear as a woman. And he talked about doing this with Monsieur and having a great relationship with Monsieur at these parties. Also, de Choisy ended up becoming a priest later in life and still cross-dressed. 
very interesting story. There's not much about him, but he's still very interesting. It's also very, very possible that everything in the memoirs is false, according to modern day historians, but it could have been totally just his fantasy. <laughs> but anyway, he talks about in his supposed memoirs written back then saying, the attribute of God is to be loved, adored. Man, as far as the weakness of his nature allows, wishes for the same. But as it is beauty that kindles love, and since that is usually the lot of women, when it happens that men have or believe themselves to have certain traits of beauty, they try to enhance them by the same methods that women use, which are most becoming. They feel the inexpressible pleasure of being loved." I have felt this more than once during a delightful affair, when I was at the ball or the theater, wearing my beautiful robe, diamonds, and patches, and heard people murmur near me, there is a lovely woman. I experienced an inward glow of pleasure, which is incomparable, it is so strong. Ambition, riches, even love do not equal it, because we always love ourselves more deeply than we do others. Hmm. Interesting. Now, I think men like this, within the context of the reign of Louis XIV, is better to look at as the beginning of camp. And it helps us kind of strike a stream that leads us to 200 years later, in the middle of the 1800s, when we meet dandies. Yes, dandy. D-A-N-D-Y. In 1836, Thomas Carlyle define dandy as a clothes-wearing man. And he goes on to say, a man whose trade, office, and existence consists in the wearing of clothes. Every faculty of his soul, spirit, purse, and person is heroically consecrated into this one object, the wearing of clothes wisely and well, so that the others dress to live, he lives to dress. And now, for all this perennial martyrdom and posy and even prophecy, what is it that the dandy asks in return? Solely, we may say, that you would recognize his existence, would admit him to be a living object, or, even failing this, a visual object, or thing that will reflect rays of light. Now, I think that's very interesting and where we need to keep in this idea of being seen. Think of de Choisy so desperately wanting to be seen as beautiful and doing all he can to be perceived as beautiful. Think of dandies who so badly want to be recognized within society, not by being like society or following all the latest trends, but by being very unique in the way they fashion trends and clothes together, including clothes that may be viewed as old and recycled and nobody's wearing that anymore, including several different types of clothing and dress and accessories in order to stand out and be seen. And something that's also very unique about dandies, perhaps something that can be the major distinction, if you're a dandy or not, is that they would still dress that way even if nobody was around, even if they're stranded on a deserted island. So it's not just about making sure they're seen, but it is also about feeling fully their own selves, fully expressing themselves for, their, for themselves. And we're going to talk about this duplicity in this episode and the upcoming episodes. There's a duplicity here. It's not one or the other. It's both. This desperate need to be seen in a world that refuses to see them, and a desperate need to express oneself purely for their own self. Let's continue. The dandy. And a great model of dandyism is Beau Brummel, or George Brian Beau Brummel, who was born 1778 and died 1840. And he was a British dandy. And in his early days, he was a college student. He did not come from aristocracy. One of his biographers wrote, His greatness was based on nothing at all. He was not rich. He was not famous. At least he didn't start out that way. 
And let me read from his Wikipedia article here, which is taken from biographies, saying, Never unpowdered or unperfumed, immaculately bathed and shaved, and dressed in a plain dark blue coat, he was always perfectly brushed, perfectly fitted, showing much perfectly starched linen, all freshly laundered, and composed with an elaborately knotted cravat. And Brummel was the first kind of incarnation of a celebrity, meaning he was famous for being famous. He didn't have any other unique talents that allowed him to provide gifts for others. He was famous for being famous, for looking amazing. But then, and this story does not end well at all, this is the classic celebrity story, but this is before they knew that this is what happens to celebrities if you're not careful, so he gets a pass, I guess. Well, he ended up inheriting his father's fortune after he died, and then he just spent all that money on costumes and gambling and just living it up. And then in 1816, he suffered bankruptcy, and he ended up fleeing to France and quietly died in 1840 in a lunatic asylum. He was 61. Another example of a dandy and someone who is extremely significant when we're talking about the history of camp is Oscar Wilde, the poet and the playwright. He was also English, born in Ireland, in 1854. And let me read you this paragraph from Susan Sontag's essay when she starts talking about Oscar Wilde. She says, Wilde himself is a transitional figure. Now, first off, yes, the dandyism isn't necessarily camp, but it is extremely important to understand dandyism as a transitional phase to get to camp. So that's why we're talking about this. Anyway, Wilde himself is a transitional figure. The man who, when he first came to London, sported a velvet beret, lace shirts, velveteen knee breeches, and black silk stockings could never depart too far in his life from the pleasures of the old style dandy. This conservatism is reflected in the picture of Dorian Gray. But many of his attitudes suggest something more modern. It was Wilde who formulated an important element of the camp sensibility, the equivalence of all objects. When he announced his intention of living up to his blue and white china, or declared that a doorknob could be as admirable as a painting, when he proclaimed the importance of the necktie, the boutonniere, the chair, Wilde was anticipating the democratic spirit of camp. And Oscar Wilde is also very famous for his short little witty quotes. And let me just read you some to kind of give you an idea of the type of person Oscar Wilde was. He wrote in The Importance of Being Earnest, Every woman becomes their mother. That's their tragedy. And no man becomes his. That's his tragedy. <laughs> Oscar Wilde wanted this extravagance, wanted this beauty. And it reminds me of La Choisy saying, I want to be looked at as beautiful the same way women are looked at as beautiful. But anyways, we'll keep going. He says in another quote from Phrases and Philosophies for the Use of the Young, one should either be a work of art or wear a work of art. This is the kind of person he was. And this was something that people were thinking about in the recent Met Gala, luckily. Some people were purposely trying to dress a little bit like Oscar Wilde. I remember hearing Cole Sprouse saying in an interview that his actual outfit was particularly inspired by this quote and he was trying to wear a work of art and Oscar Wilde is also famous for being arrested and charged and imprisoned for years for homosexuality and while he was in prison he actually wrote this amazing deeply spiritual letter called De Profundis and we're going to talk about that in the next episode when we talk about more of the spiritual side of this all but at the end of his life, shortly before his death, here's the last quote I'll read from him. He said, My wallpaper and I are fighting a duel to the death. One or the other of us has to go. I love that. Oscar Wilde's so playful, so extravagant and exaggerated and outrageous. And this dandy aesthetic and sensibility and feeling and posture in the world is, like I said, a transitional phase, but it is one, like I said, of an example of doing what you can to be seen in society.
and doing that through fashion and aesthetics. And in 1868, now we're getting to the actual word camp here, we get the first mention we can find of the word camp being used as a sort of adjective. Before, when we had the mention of camping about, it was more of a verb. But this adjective was in a letter written by the Victorian cross-dresser Fanny Park to his cross-dressing lover and performance partner Thomas Bolton. And in the letter he says, My campish undertakings are not at the present meeting the success that they deserve. Whatever I do seems to get me into hot water somewhere. And both of them, who wrote several love letters to each other, I think we have access to more of them as well, they're famous in LGBT rights history because they also were arrested for homosexuality. They actually didn't get charged because the court couldn't prove that they were actually having sex with each other, but it's also super scandalous because they were caught with actually a third guy, and the third guy just totally stabbed them in the back, which, I mean, the punishment for homosexuality really sucks, so, I mean, there's some, I guess, sometimes justified snitching. No, he's a jerk. Anyway, he said, this third guy said, oh, I thought there were women, because they're, they dress as women, they cross-dress, even though they he was hanging out with them while they were cross-dressing and dressing as men. Very scandalous. And now I want to talk about drag in particular. At the Met Gala, Lena Waithe wore a jacket. It's really hard to explain what this jacket looks like. Just look up Lena Waithe Met Gala jacket. And on the jacket, there is these the lyrics embroidered on them, written vertically, lyrics to the song I'm Coming Out, and the other song was I Will Survive. And in big big letters on the back. It said, Black Drag Queens Invented Camp. Now, technically not necessarily accurate. And it's funny, I saw people on Twitter kind of arguing about this. Even um, Black Drag Queens saying, um, yeah, we didn't invent camp. Have heard of Oscar Wilde? And uh, so it's like, there is a longer history that precedes black drag queens but black drag queens are the ones who took camp and drag queens in general who took camp this campish aesthetic and sensibility and used it as a survival strategy to fight for their rights in the world and they redefined it for our modern understanding of camp and usually when people talk about camp and they say, what is camp? It's easiest to just point to drag queens to explain it. Because like I said, it's hard to explain. And first off, for those that don't know, drag queen is not the same as transgender. You may be hearing me say drag queen if you're unfamiliar with this language and think, isn't that like a little offensive? Um, no, it's a different category. It's men who dress up as, I don't even want to say woman, who dress up as exaggeratedly feminine as a performance, as a theatrical thing. And the hugely famous, possibly the most famous drag queen, RuPaul, you know, from the reality show RuPaul's Drag Race, he once said, I do not impersonate females. How many women do you know who wear seven inch heels, four foot wigs, and skin tight dresses? I don't dress like a woman, I dress like a drag queen. That's a really, really good way of putting it. Also, Violet Chachki, who was a winner in the seventh season of his drag race show, was at the Met Gala, and you can look up that outfit too. But at the Met Gala, Violet Chachki said, To the fashion world, a man in a dress will always be camp. In the world of drag, there are different categories, and camp drag queens perform in a way that's specifically humorous and self-aware, in a way that alludes to the artifice of everything. And drag queens, I would probably give them the biggest credit for leading the awareness of what has become the LGBTQ movement. 
And it's kind of interesting to even use that word movement because we're talking about people. We're, we're not just even talking about one singular conformative community of people. We're talking about a hugely diverse group of people that aren't all the same, that live different types of lives and that think differently and fight for their rights differently. And yet we put all these people into an under the label movement because organization was required in order to fight for these rights, in order to fight for the right to simply just not be killed or arrested or abused. The first Pride Parade was actually a very quiet, calm gathering and commemoration of the Stonewall Riots. And as it continued and spread across the, U the United States, it became more and more extravagant and flamboyant and, as, as uh, conservatives would say, out there <laughs> because they demanded to be seen in a world that refused to see them. I, I actually feel like if we never had the wildly, outrageously extravagant pride parades that we've had over the years, I, like, I kind of want to say, I definitely can say that LGBTQ rights wouldn't be nearly as far as it is today. But I kind of also wonder if people would still be violent towards them if we today, if we never had that. And the thing is, people, I grew up in an environment of Christian conservatism where people would see pride parades as a kind of threat, as a kind of like an attempt at intimidating Christian conservatives. Like, and there would be all these obnoxious complaints about like, why do they have to flaunt it? Why do they have to be all out there? Why do they have to be so flamboyant? Blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, if they weren't, then you could just continue ignoring them. I think that's the origin of this, this stereotypical flamboyance that is kind of turned on by many people in LGBTQ communities that they realize this is a survival strategy in order to fight for my rights because if I'm not flamboyant and campish and extravagant with the way I present myself, the people will just continue ignoring us. I don't know if this was actually done consciously, but I'm saying all of this from a sociological perspective, not necessarily a psychological one. And Mark Booth also wrote about this in his book on camp, and he said, The primary type of the marginal in society is the traditional feminine, which camp parodies in an exhibition of stylized effeminacy. And this extent of its commitment, such parody informs the camp person's whole personality, throwing an ironical light on, not only on the abstract concept of the sexual stereotype, but also on the paradist of him or herself. And he also writes, To be camp is to present oneself as being committed to the marginal with a commitment greater than the marginal merits. I love that quote so much. I also want to mention Susan Sontag's perspective on this, on the homosexual, I use that in quotes here, element of camp, when she says, Nevertheless, even though homosexuals have been its vanguard, camp taste is much more than homosexual taste. Obviously, its metaphor of life as theater is peculiarly suited as a justification and projection of a certain aspect of the situation of the homosexuals. Yet one feels that if homosexuals hadn't more or less invented camp, someone else would. Yeah, someone else would. But the LGBTQ community had to in order to survive. My sources on this episode is coming from all over the place. Now I'm going to read you a source from Twitter. 
the Twitter page, Academic Foxhole, who is also talking about camp and talking about the political elements of it. He wrote on his Twitter, Camp is a survival strategy developed by queer men and trans women in the face of a society that didn't recognize them and tried to eradicate them for the last 150 so years. It uses humor, excess, and subversion, usually of things deemed feminine, to make space, to diffuse political violence, to create underground communities, to find self and representations that didn't originally include you to send secret codes for those who are in the know. It is a whole set of practices with a long history. You can see camp in a drag queen's giant wig or camp in the gay man in the 1950s being led to a paddy wagon by cops after a raid in a gay bar who walks towards the van as if walking a runway. It is found in some of the one-liners Mae West got from her queer friends. This is why I agree with Mark Booth when he says camp belongs to the marginalized and why the Met Gala was so confusing, awkward, and irritating because it is supposed to be a tool used by the marginalized of society to be seen when they are unseen, not used by rich and famous celebrities who are looked at too much. And Susan Sontag explains this in her essay, too. And I love, love, love this paragraph. It explains it so well. She says, The experiences of camp are based on the great discovery that the sensibility of high culture has no monopoly upon refinement. Camp asserts that good taste is not simply good taste, that there exists indeed a good taste of bad taste. Jeanette talks about this on Our Lady of the Flowers. The discovery of the good taste of bad taste can be very liberating. The man who insists on high and serious pleasures is depriving himself of pleasure. I mean, let me repeat that. The, I'm, like, I'm talking about the rich, powerful, famous celebrity. The man who insists on high and serious pleasures is depriving himself of pleasure. Why? She goes on and says, he continually restricts what he can enjoy. In the constant exercise of good taste, he will eventually price himself out of the market, so to speak. Here, camp taste supervenes upon good taste as a daring and witty hedonism. It makes the man of good taste cheerful, where before he ran the risk of being chronically frustrated, it is good for the digestion. And I love that idea of like, People who actually chase after super high fashion and high taste, these very expensive and exclusive ways of dressing and living life, even just through the stuff they buy, you're actually living, it doesn't seem like it, but you're actually living a very restricted life when you say, I only buy high fashion. I only buy expensive clothes or I only buy brand name products, stuff like that. You're restricting yourself from the entire world of aesthetics, art, culture, and beauty. And camp says, we're going to use it all. We're not bougie like you guys who only rock what's hot, trending, and expensive. We're going to use it all. And we may look ridiculous doing it, but at least you'll actually finally notice us. And while we're kind of on this economic perspective of this all, I want to also mention Andrew Ross's sociological analysis on camp. And he says camp aesthetics became the site of personal liberation from the stranglehold of the corporate capitalist state. Within the capitalist environment of constant consumption, Camp rediscovers history's waste, bringing back objects thought of as refuse or of bad taste. Camp liberates objects from the landfills of history and reinvokes them with a new charisma. In doing so, Camp creates an economy separate from that of the state. Camp is the recreation of surplus value from forgotten forms of labor. No, that is pretty powerful. Okay, done. I'm done quoting and just reading stuff to you. Now, let's go just, just a little, little bit deeper here. When I started to learn about camp as this way of getting society to see communities that are unseen, I started to think about the theological parallels. I started to think of people like Jesus of Nazareth, who looked at with compassion on the marginalized of society. Like so much of the Gospels 
you see what sets Jesus apart is really his ability to see people. It's like there's so many stories of healings that begin with Jesus walking by a sick person that everyone else just walks by every day. And yet Jesus decides to stop and communicate with them and then heal them and anoint them. One of my favorite people, Barry Taylor, who I've also interviewed on this podcast, talked about his conversion of Christianity involved him reading the Bible for the first time, going through the Gospels, and getting to this story where a prostitute comes into this house where Jesus is eating dinner, eating dinner at a religious teacher's house, and this prostitute comes and starts washing Jesus' feet with her hair, and the religious teacher looks and says, Ugh! If Jesus only knew who this woman was, he wouldn't be letting her touch him. And Jesus says, do you see this woman? He goes on and says some more stuff after that. But just that sentence right there, Barry Taylor was floored and realized, oh, wow, Jesus is different. The religious teacher in this story did not actually see this woman. And I also think about this passage in Matthew and Luke of Jesus looking on a mountain at all of Jerusalem and seeing the people and having compassion on them, realizing how lost and struggling they are. And then he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I also think of Siddhartha Gautama, who became known as the Buddha, who was a Indian Hindu prince who was very, very closed off from the rest of the world. For all his life growing up, he only knew the inside of this rich and powerful kingdom until one day he asked, according to the legend, he asked to be led on a tour outside to see the people. And they set up a very, very strict closed off path to take him through to make sure he doesn't see the suffering and sick people. But an old, poor, sick guy accidentally was where he didn't belong. And Siddhartha Gautama saw him and was like, what is that? And he ran away and suddenly was exposed to this outside hurt, suffering world of the poor and starving and marginalized. And that's when he decided to start his path of enlightenment. I also think of something that uh, Siddhartha Gautama was frustrated with was the caste system and the restrictive way of understanding reincarnation in association with the caste system that if someone is born poor, it's because they were bad in the previous life. If someone was born rich, it's because they were good in the previous life. And he felt like that was extremely unfair, particularly if the lowest in the caste system is called the untouchables. That's like, that's like literally saying, hey, society, completely ignore these people, please. Don't even think about them. Don't look at them. Don't touch them. So many of these types of marginalized communities exist throughout history and throughout all our world. And I think the figures that we value the most throughout history are the people who were able to stop and see them. I also think about the yellow vest protests going on in France right now. Interesting, we've been talking about France. In France, they got a very neoliberal president there right now called Emmanuel Macron. And in the name of helping the world with its crisis of climate change, he raised the taxes on diesel fuel, which actually only made it way harder for the poor working class in France. You may be thinking, what? Why are people even still driving cars that need diesel fuel? Well, the people who are driving cars who need diesel fuel in France are only driving those because they can't afford anything else. So literally the tax that he raised in order to help the world in reality just screwed over the poor working class and so in response they held these riots and protests wearing these bright reflective yellow vests you know the ones that cross guards wear it's like it's it's poetic 
almost of like the the reason they even got everyone to dress like that is one they needed to be organized and two everyone had one in their back seat because it was required by law and yet it's so interesting that it's a reflective vest that they're using in these protests and riots where they're desperately trying to get the people in power to see their needs and not to keep ignoring them anymore. That's powerful. That yellow reflective vest in that context is so camp, in my opinion. Actual camp. Like, not the Met Gala type camp. <laughs> now let me talk about one more example of camp. I'm going to read you something, and I'm sorry. I know I said I'm not going to read anything anymore in this episode, but I totally forgot I wanted to bring this up, and it needs to be brought up. One more example of camp in this context that we're talking about it right now. This is a entry in the journals of a colonel who was at a Bergen belsen concentration camp during the Holocaust. Says in this journal entry, it was shortly after the British Red Cross arrived, though it may have no connection, that a very large quantity of lipstick arrived. This was not at all what we wanted. We were screaming for hundreds and thousands of other things, and I don't know who asked for lipstick. I wish so much that I could discover who did it. It was the action of genius, sure, unadulterated brilliance. I believe nothing did more for these internees than the lipstick. Women lay in bed with no sheets and no nighty, but with scarlet red lips. You saw them wandering about with nothing but a blanket over their shoulders, but with scarlet red lips. I saw a woman dead on the post-mortem table, and clenched in her hand was a piece of lipstick. At last, someone had done something to make them individuals again. They were someone, no longer merely the number tattooed on the arm. At last, they can take an interest in their appearance. That lipstick started to give them back their humanity. Now that, my friends, is camp. Hopefully, you're getting it by now. At least in the way that we're talking about it, because like I said, it's hard to define camp. But there's this part two. I hope you enjoyed it. The next episode, we're going to be talking about camp within religion. We're going to talk about the way Oscar Wilde talked about religion, the way Walt Whitman talked about religion. I love Walt Whitman, by the way. And we're going to talk about biblical examples of camp. It's going to be awesome. So thank you for listening to this episode. Hopefully I see you in the next one. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at GodTalkPod or my personal Instagram and Twitter at WhoIsDamon. Let me know if you're enjoying this series. Let me know how you're doing and I'll see you on the next one. All right. Bye-bye.